What is up, all you GBA side people? This is Tom, and we're here with your pick and crew, week seven. Back after a long hiatus, with me as always. Hey guys, how's it going? It's McCaddy. Last week, we saw our first perfect week for two people, not just one. Isn't that right, Will? Yeah, really, really impressive, and definitely brings them back in the running as well, especially Kelly. Uh, I mean, having uh, having a look at the totals, Kelly is currently tied with me and Burke in terms of first place. So the competition is definitely heating up right now. It only takes a few more perfect weeks, and someone is definitely going to be able to pull ahead from there. You know what's funny? And this is kind of a, a something I looked at. I went from being second behind you to now second to last after oh, like four no. and four. <laughs> <laughs> actually yeah it was a pretty disastrous week for you i must admit i mean four and four i was the worst again uh, but but that's okay because i'm awful at uh picking leagues for like you know american sports so not really enough. shocking <laughs> <laughs> maybe a coin next time or something like that would be a better way <laughs> so our our totals from last week as we said uh eight no for blue of all people good job blue and kelly Seven and one for Burke, six and two for you as well as Hank. Or no, I'm sorry, for Baby Nick as well as Hank, and then five and three for you, and four and four for me. So ironic that the two people that were first and second go last and second to last. Yeah, it's definitely making the competition a lot more heated. I I must admit, like we still got quite a few weeks left, but it's, it is going to be really interesting to see. And I think it's also shown that even though a lot of the people look quite far behind, it only takes one good week for them and one bad week for you for them to actually sneak up ahead and pip you. Yeah, and I mean, we're all relatively close, so... In terms of our lock of the weeks, you're still perfect. We have three, four, and twos, one, five, and one, and me at three and three. Ooh. Mm. <laughs> and then overall, you are tied with Kelly and Burke, 33 and 15. 32 and 16 for baby Nick, 31 and 17 for Hank, and then me at 30 and 18, and 26 and 22 for Blue. So starting off, we have John versus Geo, and it looks as though baby Nick and I are the only two that are picking uh, Geo, solely because Geo is still hot, and I could see him picking this game up, mostly because the team matchup is kind of there. Uh, mm. You know, the, the fact that Entei and Mega Pinsir are such threats that I think that with the right type of planning, Geo could... Uh, create a solid plan to put pressure on John's walls, which are kind of, they're not the best options, but I'm not sure they could take, take so many hits from the combined strength of Mega Pinsir and Entei. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I'd definitely say that. I think it's it's going to come down to what coverage move he decides to put on Mega Pinsir, because I wouldn't be surprised to see John run something like Defensive Hydreigon to check uh, the Entei, just like, you know, obviously Season 4. Uh, what Miguel did. And uh, obviously if the pincer then has Earthquake for the Lantern instead of uh, Close Combat or something like that, then obviously the Hydreigon might have be able to wall it or at least check it to an extent. And, uh, as, you know, if it does then has Close Combat and John decides to bring uh, the Lantern, then obviously that's going to have the potential to wall him from that side. So I think it is going to come down to that sort of matchup and how Geo actually decides to set up those uh, potential sweepers. Like I said, it'll come down to just what each player chooses to do for the specific week and just how and just how thorough their planning is from mm. beginning to finish. Yeah, and that brings it on to sort of an extra point as well about they've had two weeks to prep here, so it is going to be interesting to see the comparison between the teams that have actually spent, you know, two weeks taking a break from Pokemon and actually sort of relaxing, because it is quite a stressful thing to try and do these week on week, or the people that have actually kept their head in the game and actually used those two weeks to get a really nice, polished team ready for this one. So uh, I think this week is going to be really, really interesting from that aspect. Well then, all right, how about then from there, you know, we'll do the chatter point early. Do you think that most that there's going to be more teams that are going to take the, the break off, or there's going to be more teams that decide to use that extra week of planning, or at least kind of bolster their thoughts that they already had prior to the week off. I think it's difficult to sort of specifically name people, but uh, I think with Christmas being in the way as well, I imagine it's going to come down to sort of, you know, family commitments or something like that. But uh, it's also just how much people want to get a win as well. I could definitely see, uh, you know, okay, I'm going to name, say, say for example, Steve, I could definitely see Steve putting, you know, using that extra time to his advantage and really putting in effort to try and get a really good team for this one. Very true. I can even see someone like Tup against a, 
you know, a coach like Fizz doing a lot of work to attempt to have that really good game plan. Mm. Obviously, that goes for any coach, of course. But then you have, you know, marquee matchups like Dan versus Shady, John versus Geo, even Nips versus George. All those teams, I think, an extra week of planning could be the, the difference maker between a win and a loss for such a great matchup like those coming up. Yeah, definitely. So moving on from there, we have Fizz versus Tup. Now, everyone but Blue is picking Fizz, and he is going, of course, being the black sheep, going and picking Tup. Yeah, he may have that magical vision again. We'll just have to see. But uh, I'm definitely going to stick with Fizz for this one. I just think he's got, overall, I've seen a lot better prep from him, better execution, and also sort of better predictions as well within the uh, the actual battle. He's also got some good ways to check extra as well in the form of, you know, wheezing, chestnut. So I think Tup's not going to be able to go down that route as easily as he may be able to do against other teams. That we've just seen that. Fizz is capable of making these sets that are almost perfectly suited for week to week, and it's not in a general sense like this wall just has whatever I need it to do utility-wise, but even it comes down to uh, the specific EVs, you know, what it can take, mm. what it can't, coverage moves, and then, like even we saw last week with, like, the Magnet Rise Doe Blade, you know, that was, it was very effective, and if I recall, it was Jolly, so it was able to outspeed uh, the Apowdon, if I recall, yeah. Yeah. So things like that, things to me kind of stick out to where they're, it's, it, that type of planning is very effective. Um, so that's why I'm picking Business Week. Okay, uh, so moving on, we've got a match of Shady versus Dan, which I must admit, I'm really looking forward to this one. This one's going to be really quite interesting. I think Shady just needs to sort of, he, he's almost got to battle with his demons within himself as well as battling Dan. Uh, I, do, I do remember watching him in the UCL and he... You know, you could definitely see it was preying on his mind. And I think overall, I think Dan is going to pip it for this one. I think he's been playing better this uh, season. But on the other hand, I think if Mega Venusaur's played right, I think Dan could have quite a big problem with that. Very good point. Uh, I can certainly see that as well. You know, he doesn't have the most options for Mega Venusaur. So, yeah, if, you make, if Shady does use Mega Venusaur the right way, it could work. Moving on from there. We have Gubbs versus Mavone. The thing with these two coaches, it's, you know, Mavone has been very static for most of his team building. Um, you know, maybe a little lack of lackadaisical, if you want to use that term. And then you have Gubbs, who's attempting to, you know, prove himself mm. as after coming back after such a long hiatus. Now, obviously, we're all going with Gubbs, solely because I think that just the, the effort is there. So hopefully it pans out. Yeah. No, definitely. I think my, my thoughts on this is that it's almost like t both coaches have got two different kinds of rust on them. You've got Gubbs, which is, who's, you know, rusty because obviously he's not played in league format for a while. Whereas Mulvone, is, there's still a bit of rust on his team and he's still trying to get his head around how it actually plays and how to perform, you know, how to perform well with it. And I think this match is definitely going to come down to who has got rid of the most amount of rust for this one. And, you know, maybe we can see... Mulvone attempting to use that extra week to certainly benefit himself. Mm. Do that little bit of extra team prep, which could come in really handy for this match. Right, and maybe if he did have a break from work or from school, or maybe I'm mixing, mixing him up with Hayden, you know, having that break would allow him to have that time to uh, break off and attempt to look more deeply into his team rather than just kind of take the, the skim surface look and running with what he thinks from a, a quick view is the best option. Yeah, definitely. Okay, In so moving on, we have got Nips versus George. I personally think that George has almost definitely got this one. I think he's he's shown he's a man with a plan for every single week, and um, Goffertel can really mess with a lot of Nips' walls, and as long as George can handle a lot of Nips' this sort of offense and stuff like that, I think George with Megalopony, he's got T-Spikes options and stuff like that. So with Nips only having one Defogger as well, George will have the chance to potentially be able to trap that and remove that and then start doing some hazard stacking from there. I don't know, have you got anything else to add from there? Pretty much goes over what I was going to say. We'll not talk about Nick versus Hayden. We're all picking Nick for the sole purpose that Nick had. So up until now, I just got to be able to watch Nick's battle. Um, prior to this, we the footage was not there yet. But watching Nick, and he's still able to 
team prep and build in such a way that it's effective and it ensures that he goes in with a very solid plan. Whereas we're looking at Hayden and his maybe his drive, his motivation, his uh, maybe even self confidence is lacking just a little bit mm. because you even listen to him in his commentaries and you know week after week when he you know when he loses he drops one the confidence isn't quite there. So hopefully you know we see Nick or at least Hayden have a better showing than what he's had, but we're all going to pick Nick on this one, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely. I think it is definitely going to come down to two things with Hayden. It's whether it's whether he's become demoralized or not, because honestly, like going into league matches, it's your mindset is so important. And if, it, yes, if his it mind is. isn't there, it's, it's going to be so hard for him to then go on and beat Nick. I think also it's how effectively he's used those two weeks, because these two weeks could be really, really valuable for him. And if this gives him the opportunity to actually test his team a little bit more, you know, dig deeper into the movesets and actually produce a well-polished team, I think he, you know, he's got the potential there to actually beat Nick in this one. But I think as a safe bet, I think Nick is definitely the best one to go for for this one. Miguel versus Steve. Milwaukee versus the Real Muril. We have the champ versus the underdog, like in all sense of the word. We're all picking Miguel on this one. Unfortunately, you know, with Kelly's whole believe in Steve. Are you believing in Steve this week? I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> no, that? I, I, I wouldn't say so. Not for this week. Maybe maybe for others I could, I could see it. But Miguel is just, he's such a strong opponent. And I, I think also Miguel will not want to let Steve get a win on this one. And he just can't afford, especially in terms of how he's doing in the running and everything like that. I think it would be really... He, he's going to know how big of a detriment this one will be if he ends up losing this one. So I don't think he's going to let Steve get a single shred of chance of winning this one. Mm. All right, so then would you carry the same sentiment into the next match being Crimson versus Lars? Do you think that Crimson kind of holds the same sort of underdog and Lars is is in a very uh, have-to-win type situation? Yeah, that's what I would definitely say is that Lars has been sort of slightly set back uh, from a couple, you know, a couple of losses and stuff like that. And being able to then... Get this win is going to help secure him, to, you know, to let him stay ahead in his division. And I think he's not, he can't really afford to let Crimson beat him on this one. So I, I could see Lars using those extra two weeks for his advantage. Uh, it then also then comes down to how much Crimson has used that as well. Uh, so this one could be, it, you know, it could be interesting. I think, as I said, it's, it's going to come down to how much of that extra two weeks those guys have used, you know, to, you know, to their advantage. Hopefully, though, we could see Crimson maybe build off of the momentum he created for himself last week versus Dan. You know, we saw him play up until a certain point very well with us with Suicune. So maybe just with that knowledge or seeing that Suicune does have a very high impact on his team, it's very effective even with his with his uh, his planning. Maybe we can see him use that and use that growth, of that knowledge, and bring it into this match. Yeah, I could definitely see him using it more to his advantage because it's it's one of those Pokemon where it, if you don't have a really solid answer to it, it can just be an absolute pain to try and deal with. Crooklyn, so, um, yeah. yeah, as long as he can just use it to his advantage and know when to you know heal up and when to not heal up and stuff like that, I think he could definitely use it as a really effective tool, especially in this format. Not a, yeah, like I said, Crocoon is a gigantic pain, so so is that happening. <laughs> it's just any, any format, it's a gigantic pain. <laughs> oh, we never even talked about the locks of the week. <sighs> Go us. So we have me and Kelly picking the Borussia Don fan as our locks of the week. Pretty much my sentiment is what you just said, uh, but Kelly kind of said it a little better. He said that basically Lars has been on a very solid planning streak, and Crimson we've seen play a match, uh, so to say, 80% of the way through. He thinks that Lars will lock up the win with this one. I kind of agree. So then we have Burke, maybe Nick, and Hank all picking the San Francisco Arcaniners and George for their locks of the week. Baby Nick says George will be able to decimate Nips' walls with hazards and strong offense, like you said, and his attackers will be able to lock up a 4-0 victory or better. Bold claim. I like it. Uh, Burke kind of said something of the same line, and then Hank... Roughly the same. They all strongly believe in what George has been doing so far. The planning is there. The preparation, the playing, you know, and knowing what your, his opponent's going to do. You know, coming out from the D-League, this is what kind of uh, what Burke said, coming out from the D-League, it, it basically proves that he was just as viable as any of the coaches, even more so. 
since being brought up from the D-League, and it's not like he was any less prepared coming up mm. than anyone yeah. else. So for my lock of the week, I decide to go for uh, Miguel on this one with Steve versus Miguel. So I think this is the by far the safest match to bet on. As as I've said before, Miguel is an incredibly strong opponent, and I don't think he's going to let Steve have an even you know shred of chance of winning this one. And uh, yeah, there's not <laughs> not much else to add from there really. And then Blue also added in. Miguel's been on fire lately. He's got the skills and the team to take home the win. He, it's not that he doesn't believe in Steve. Hashtag believe in Steve. But he has to be real and go with the Merrill for this one. What a bad pun. Shame oh on you, God. what a bad pun. <laughs> Does anyone else want to replace Blue as a uh, member of the Pick'em crew? <laughs> yeah, Submit, we're submit your applications open... now. <laughs> exactly. Submit your applications below. Oh, man. Okay. With that being said, thank you for enjoying the Pick'em crew for this week. Next week, we'll see how these all pan out. And hopefully I'm in a better contention because this is, this is horse hockey. <laughs> um. Yeah, definitely. So uh, hope you guys enjoy the video and uh, hope you guys also enjoy the matches on Sunday and see how your picks do from there. Yeah, sounds good. See you guys on Sunday.